Um, well, good afternoon, everybody from uh, here in Birmingham in the UK. Thank you to everybody in our parliamentary network and our partners for joining us on what is our fourth and, and final session um, during this week of the annual meetings. Um, as this is our final session, it's, um, it's my um, great pleasure to say a huge thank you to all of the team at the parliamentary network, including Gagana and the team uh, working with her there in Paris um, for organising um, a, a really productive week um, of discussions for parliamentarians um, around the world. Um, and in this final session, what we're going to do is, is zero in on one of the debates um, that we kickstart in our book, uh, Just Transitions, uh, which is um, on the new digital platform that we launched this week. Um, and the focus is on the question of how do we mobilise private sector investment to deliver the kind of inclusive growth and the kind of green recovery um, that we need to aim for uh, over the months and the years to come. We've now had a, a million of the people that we serve uh, lose their lives to COVID, uh, and we now stand on the brink of 100 million more being plunged into absolute poverty. So the risk that we now run is that a pandemic of COVID now triggers a pandemic of poverty that takes us as a world years to recover from. Um, nonetheless, I think from listening to the debates this week, there's a very clear sense that the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement remain very much the kind of North Star that most of us want to steer by. But again, listening to fellow parliamentarians this week, there are three hurdles that are obviously now looming large in people's minds. One, um, the collapse in revenues that we now see to finance the debt already in place. Uh, David Malpass at the beginning of the week set out the scale of it, about 758 billion uh, in debt. Um, very significant problems now emerging um, for debt distress uh, for many countries. Second, the scale of the costs going into 2021 will be enormous, um, both in terms of economic support, but also sustaining public services and crucially the health response uh, around the world. Um, and then there is the uh, the third hurdle that we have to cross, that hurdle that has been, uh, that challenge that has been set out by uh, Crystalline from the IMF as well as others this week, which is about how do we mobilise um, the investment that we need to make sure that the recovery that does emerge is a green recovery and de-risks our path to achieving the goals that we agreed to um, in Paris. Um, very significant set of problems, um, very significant set of challenges and impossible to solve unless we uh, do a better job at mobilising private sector investment. Now, yesterday, the fiscal monitor, um, I thought, helped set out um, some quite clear um, metrics and quite clear inspiration in a way. The point that it made is that um, a 1% of GDP increase in public sector investment in infrastructure could help unlock a 2.7% GDP increase and create 20 to 33 million jobs. So I don't think anybody thinks that we can get the private sector piece to work without some pretty concerted action on the public sector side. But equally, I think many of us feel that we need better frameworks to help channel private sector investment, especially pension investment, um, into the kind of recovery that we want to see. And to kickstart that debate, I'm really pleased that we're publishing today um, uh, a thought paper from the Centre for Progressive Policy um, based in London, uh, one of our partner organisations that sets out um, some of the ideas that I hope we'll be debating with many of the people who are on this call this morning, uh, this afternoon. Um, in particular, how do we begin mobilising investment to fill five gaps in economic infrastructure, education, health, um, the gender gap and uh, the innovation gap. So um, this is uh, the, what I hope will be the beginning um, of a big piece of work for the Parliamentary Network um, over the next year. And I'm really delighted that we've got such a brilliant panel um, to help us get this debate started today. Now, I think we may still be waiting for our keynote speaker, although tell me um, if our keynote has arrived, Stephanie. Um, but we're going to kickstart with a, a very short video from the International Finance Corporation first. Um, so, Shorto, if we could just kick that off um, and then we'll open the debate. Thanks.
let us do the right thing. You're not going to create jobs. We want to have more efficiency. Things that can be done by the private sector should not be done by government. Less talking, more doing. It means that we can empower ourselves. We have, um, through our teams here, we're giving them the same curriculum, the same knowledge as somebody sitting in Silicon Valley right now. You will realize that it was actually a sleeping market that nobody was looking at. Great, thank you. So with that stirring audiovisual kickstart, let me um, hand the stage and the screen to Stephanie von Freiburg, who is the Executive Vice President uh, of the IFC and Interim Managing Director. Um, Stephanie, the stage and the screen is yours. Please give us your 10 minutes. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. That's actually a hard act to follow. I like the video. <laughs> um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. It is a, an honor and a pleasure to come and talk about the private sector and in particular IFC's role and how we can think about rebuilding greener uh, and more inclusively as a result of the recovery. Um, as you know, this is actually the first time that we've had a specific uh, topic of the private sector on the parliamentary network. And so I would like to take this opportunity to step back and frame the conversation for you in relation to where IFC sits today and why I think we sit in exactly the right place. Four years ago, we celebrated our 60th anniversary. And in celebrating our 60th anniversary, our CEO at the time asked us to do a retrospective of IFC. And what we learned is that the organization had actually grown in two waves. The first wave was in the early 1960s when we were, just after we were founded, when we started to work with multinational corporations, helping them move from the developed world into emerging markets. In fact, the first transaction we ever did was with Siemens uh, in Brazil. And we had very substantive growth in our balance sheet, and then it flattened out. And then we decided, okay, what is that next growth wave? And we created that next growth wave by decentralizing our organization, beginning to work with local companies and regional companies as they invested both domestically and expanded regionally. And you saw through about 2010, again, another large growth in our business. And then it flattened out with a growth of say two or 3% a year. So the natural question the CEO then asked us was, What's that next big growth wave? How do we push IFC to help the world solve the most difficult development challenges? And thus was born what we call our 3.0 strategy. And that 3.0 strategy really rests on two pillars. The first is figuring out how we create more bankable projects. And we do that in a couple of different ways. One is partnering much more closely uh, with other development finance institutions, and in particular, our sister organization, the World Bank, to ensure that we set the right policy and regulatory framework to attract the private sector. So great example I can give you of something we've done recently. There was a billion dollar development policy operation in Kenya, where we helped the Kenyans design a framework for affordable housing that could be developed by the private sector. The second leg of our strategy is really about how do we crowd in additional capital so that we all know from Addis and beyond 
that there is patient capital sitting on the sidelines and we need to find ways to bring that into our projects. So IFC has our asset management company where we've been able to bring sovereign wealth funds, pension funds into our equity positions. We've created our MCPP, which allows us to attract insurance company into longer tenured projects. We need more and more of that. So the second pillar of the strategy really is how do we attract more capital? And when we finished the strategy, we sat back and said, this is a very good piece of work, but we're not sure our balance sheet can actually sustain it. So in 2018, with the help of all of you and all of our shareholders, uh, our shareholders and capitals endorsed a legendary five and a half billion dollar capital increase for IFC. And as part of that, we made a couple of critical uh, commitments. One was doubling our book of business by 2030. And the second was doing 40% of that in the world's poorest countries in IDA and FCS. And today, when I look both at the strategy and at our capital increase, and I look at where the world is today, I think our strategy could not have been better placed for what the world's facing today and the capital increase even more necessary to ensure that we can lean in. So as you said, our estimates are that as much as 150 million people will end up in extreme poverty in 2021. We see that governments have used their fiscal space, what limited fiscal space they had to actually help uh, citizens as part of the COVID crisis. And in the poorest countries, there's no fiscal space left. And we know that at least $950 billion has left emerging markets from the private sector over the course of the last year. So IFC must leverage its strategy and its experience to figure out how we bring the private sector back to emerging markets to create the economic growth and the jobs that we need to bring recovery. We're doing that in three ways. I call it the three R's. The first one is relief. So what we did at the start of the crisis was actually look back in history and say, what has IFC done in other crises that might be relevant to what we've done today, what we should do today? And what we found is that in the 2008 crisis, we didn't do enough. We didn't lean in and we didn't help our existing clients. So very early in March, we went to our shareholder and asked them for an $8 billion fast track COVID facility that we could make available to our existing clients, both for financial institutions to on lend to SMEs and women, as well as to the real sector. So we've been able to do things like support the International Medical Group, which is a Ugandan medical services company, and they're going to expand services to hundreds of thousands of Ugandans over the course of the next year, and oftentimes in very low income communities. We've helped a company in Vietnam continue to do affordable housing, all from that COVID facility. So then the second leg that we're looking at, the second R, is restructuring. And here we have to fall back on our strategy. We know that a, a wave of insolvencies and bankruptcies are coming our way. We need to work very closely with our World Bank colleagues to ensure that the policy and regulation is in place in as many countries as possible to expedite that insolvency process and reallocate those assets where necessary and keep as many companies afloat to preserve jobs as possible. And finally, the third R is really rebuilding resiliency. Here we do need to push our IFC strategy. So we know that after the 2008 crisis, it took over three years for the amount of FDI and private sector investment in emerging markets to return. The crisis that we face today is nothing like the 2008 crisis. 2008 pales in comparison. As a result, without some means to accelerate that, it could take us a decade to bring that much investment, private sector investment back to emerging markets. And we need to find a way to do it so that we fight for equality, we build human capital, and we address the climate crisis. When I think about how do we fight for equality, I think about access to services and infrastructure. Today, we know that there are 3.5 billion people who are not connected to the internet. If we could create ubiquitous access in Africa alone, we could increase GDP on the continent, but 1.5% a year. On the human capital, we know that we have We've seen the fragility that's been created in health systems and in education. We've watched governments struggle to create 
technology platforms and broadcast platforms to educate the 1 billion children who are out of school. And yet there's 450 million children who don't have access to the internet, to education, or to any kind of broadcast. We must ensure that they receive education. Ed education is an equalizer and we cannot leave those children out. And finally, we have to address climate change. We need to accelerate our investment in green infrastructure. We need to use the innovation of the private sector to do that. The International uh, Renewable Agency believes that we could create as many as 40 million jobs by 2050 by investing in the right green assets. But we can't do that unless we can design bankable projects that will attract private investment and we can use private investment anywhere possible through our cascade approach so that we do not use the very limited government money and government fiscal space that remains. And the best example I can give you of that is what we call our scaling solar program. So we partnered with the World Bank, with MEGA and with IFC. We worked first in Zambia and at the time when we started, the price of solar was about 20 cents uh, a kilowatt hour. We created a standard format, a standard bid documents and an auction process that allowed many of our large greening companies to understand what they were bidding on, where they were bidding and how they could actually make a profitable investment. We have since moved our scaling solar platform across Africa and we recently launched it in Uzbekistan where we came in at just two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So we know with the right kind of platforms where we can attract private sector, we can expand and bring private sector where the government shouldn't have to invest. But let me end by saying, we can't do that if we don't coordinate and we don't work closely with governments and parliamentarians. We need your help to shape the right policy and regulation to attract the private sector. We need your help to make sure that all the development finance institutions play collaboratively and collectively together. Now is not a time for a race to the bottom. And we need your help in the encashment of our capital increase so that we can ensure that our own balance sheet is ready for the challenges that lie ahead. So let me just end by saying that I've been in the development world for 29 years. I've never seen the private sector more important than it is today. And I've never seen IFC more ready to tackle the challenges that we're facing than we are with our strategy. And we really look forward to working with you and to the conversation today and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, that was um, absolutely brilliant. And um, thanks for just underlining the importance of this new aspect um, of our dialogue. And I'm gonna hand the floor straight to Luke now. And, and Luke, if you wouldn't mind, if you can keep it to five minutes, then that would just allow me to get Fiona in for her contribution before she's got to go um, at half past. Luke, over to you. Merci, merci à tous. Uh, C'est vraiment... Uh... Thank you, one and all. It's a real pleasure for me to be part of this panel, and I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers, in particular the IFC. As leader of Azito Energy, which to date is one of the largest producers, independent producers of electricity in Côte d'Ivoire, my intervention will, of course, deal with one of the obstacles that has already been mentioned earlier. How can one mobilize more private capitals to and encourage investment in general, private investment in general in our countries, so that we can, in fine, promote and improve quality of service and quality of life? Allow me to share the experience of Côte d'Ivoire, which to date has had excellent results, results of which we're very proud. Our experience, I believe, can be described as marked by two main reforms uh, at the parliamentary level in the electricity sector. The first reform wave started in 1990. We had a uh, public 
utility for production distribution uh, of electricity, which was on the verge of bankruptcy. 1990, you may remember, was a rather difficult time for many African countries that were experiencing an economic crisis because of the drop in the uh, prices of uh, commodities such as coffee and cocoa. So what were we supposed to do in a situation of emergency that would allow us to continue carrying on with providing the service? The Ivorian state privatized this public utility through a contract that was granted to a private company for the very first time, uh, per which they would be managing that service. I would describe this privatization as as political in nature, because in a situation of crisis, our leaders had to rely upon a, a reference consortium who was already very present in the water sector in Cote d'Ivoire, which was a good thing. So it was a bit of a political decision to grant them the concession to operate the uh, electricity power sector. In that context, the initial state entity was maintained as the entity in charge of managing the state legacy. Following the water sector in 1990, we had a major change when the electricity sector, the management of its production, transportation and distribution was entrusted to a private operator. The second stage, which to my mind was the most decisive, started in 1994, when the means of production in Cote d'Ivoire needed to be increased in order to meet the demand, but still in that very difficult context for uh, African countries with uh, in the lack of public funds facing social important questions, education, health. So this is when we started to truly innovate. We had to innovate because we needed to find new means to finance the investments, particularly in the production phase. We turned towards the um, IPP uh, contract with uh, independent producers of power. And in this context of a difficult economic situation in a crisis, we were we needed to do this to try and meet the needs. Thus was born the very first uh, independent power producer in Cote d'Ivoire, Cipre, based on one of those IPP contract. And as I will remind you, one of the main features was that these projects are financed, built and operated by a private operator which allows the state to mobilize its resources for other priorities. Luke, that, we, that's, that's a brilliant, if, if I may, Luke, I'm just going to stop you there because that's um, a, a really good setup um, and it underlines the importance of actually dovetailing public policy re, uh, reform in uh, a particular state with financing <laughs> solutions elsewhere. Just because I need to bring Fiona in before um, 25 past, I'm going to just hand the floor to Fiona now before she has to go and then just bring you back in into the discussion um, uh, as we proceed, Luke, if that's okay. Let me just switch over to uh, Fiona because I know you've got to go. Um, thanks so much, Liam. Unfortunately, I don't sound as, I think everything sounds better in French and I'm not going to sound anywhere near as lovely with my Australian twang, even though I live in London, than my the previous speaker, unfortunately. But anyway, thanks for the opportunity to speak 
to everyone today. I really hope that wherever you are in the world, that all of your family, you and your family are safe and well. Um, so my name is Fiona Reynolds and I am the CEO of the Principles for Responsible Investment. So we work with institutional investors around the world. We have 3000 signatories to our six principles and they represent over a hundred trillion US in assets under management. So we're all about how do you bring sustainability into capital markets. And we were formed out of the UN system in 2006 to do just that. I think one of the important things is that in terms of investment, sustainability has never been more so important. Sustainability issues are really moving into the, into the mainstream. And as investors, as you know, communities and business around the world are struggling to address the impact of the pandemic, investors really owe it to their clients, but particularly to their beneficiaries, to the members of the pension funds that they um, manage money on behalf to ensure that we recover better from this pandemic, which means for us supporting recovery policies that are sustainable, that they're inclusive and that deliver concrete reforms. Really, there's no use saving for your retirement if those who are investing your money are doing it in a way that makes the world not a, not a place that you want to actually retire into. I think that we all know, of course, that governments cannot fund the recovery alone. They can't fund the sustainable development goals alone, that the private sector is crucial. But really responsible investors have expectations around the recovery. So as stewards of capital, investors need policy reforms that drive capital towards sustainable investments, which in turn finance sustainable, inclusive and net zero economies. And I think if we think back just five years, Obviously, we didn't have the pandemic, but we didn't have the Paris Agreement. We didn't have the SDGs. Investors are expected to and want to play their role to meet these goals. But is our policy and regulatory environment really keeping up? In many countries in the world, is what investors are told is that their fiduciary duty in some cases, in some countries, doesn't allow investors to prioritise sustainability outcomes over financial ones. So this, these kinds of things are something that needs to be looked at. The pandemic has put lives and economies on hold, and I think really highlighting the social and economic consequences of inequality. But at the same time, we've got to address inequality, but it hasn't stopped the climate crisis from happening. So the policy decisions that are made today and over the next couple of months and the next year are really crucial for setting markets in the right direction towards sustainable, low carbon and inclusive economies. So we think that there really needs to be a drive towards more sustainable policy requirements. I mean, uh, there has been uh, like across the last 50, the, the largest 50 economies, there are now over 700 policy instruments that incorporate ESG factors and disclosures, but there's still more that needs to be done. Uh, you know, this drive towards updating traditional finance policy frameworks needs to continue despite the crisis and it needs to align financial policies with long term sustainability goals with the SDGs with the with the Paris agreement. So we think that um, the recovery policy should focus on the, the needs and the aims um, of the uh, ensuring that the uh, sustainable uh, recovery are aligned with sustainability goals. We need to make sure that recovery packages, that bailout packages really prioritise uh, the needs of the Paris Agreement of addressing inequality. We need to make sure that where and if sectors are bailed out, that it's done so in a way that's not condition free. There needs to be conditions. For example, if you're bailing out the airline industry, I'm just using that as an example, are we making sure that the airline industry then has to take steps towards making itself more carbon neutral? What is it doing about its employees as well? So we need reforms that address the, those uh, issues and that will make sure that we create jobs. I think the, you know, we, um, we need to see this as a good opportunity to think about the fact that 
bailout money should also be looking to create jobs in the green economy. We don't need the jobs of the of the past, we need the jobs of the future. But if I, I also want to highlight that those jobs need to be good jobs. One things where we see, and, and Liam, you were putting up your book about the just transition that you have been involved in. One thing that we know where we see that people in traditional fossil fuel industries have, have really in the past had very good jobs, well-paying jobs with good pensions and health cover around the world. And one of the reasons they're reluctant to come out of those industries is because a lot of jobs that are being created do not have a good social safety nets within them. So we need to create jobs that are good jobs. And we need to also create a better social safety net in the world. I think we need a new social contract with between business, between investment, between government and between employees. Because what we've seen from this um, pandemic is that we don't. We see people going to work in developed economies every day because they don't have they don't have access to sick pay. How does this happen in some of the um, most developed economies in the world, much less in developing economies? So what we're doing at the PRI to help address in inequality is we have um, we uh, have just launched a new five year framework around human rights. How do you embed human rights into the investment process that are underpinned by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights? We also want to see um, policies that obviously uh, address jobs, but also tax reform needs to be a big area that we all look at as governments around the world. Uh, human rights, labour rights, overall, we need to really be redefining corporate purpose. And as I said, we need to be supporting a new um, social contract. I think that the pandemic has definitely increased our understanding of systemic risks, both social and environmental risks, and how these can affect long-term investment outcomes. As I said in the beginning, I think that it's shown the importance of sustainability. I think people are beginning to finally understand, those who didn't, that if you want to have a health eco healthy economy, it has to be underpinned by healthy people and a healthy planet. Mm -hmm. That people, profit and planet all need to come together, that we don't need one at the expense of the other, other. And this is why I think that policy reform, both on traditional financial policy and real economy policies, including energy, transport, industry, and aligning those with global sustainability goals matters more today than ever before. And we're really keen to work with governments around the world on how we align capital with sustainability, with the aims of governments for job creation and for money to flow into the real economy. So I'll yeah. leave it at that, Liam. Brilliant. No, Fiona, that's um, an incredibly helpful contribution in just helping us begin to build out uh, where the overlapping consensus is between different stakeholders um, in this debate. Um, I'm going to go to Stephen Davis now. Um, Stephen, you've got uh, a big election coming up. You've also had a number of um, people make interesting noises about corporate governance and you've got, I'm hoping, a stimulus bill not too far off. So give us your point of view on this debate. Yeah, thank you, uh, Liam, and thank you to the Parliamentary Network. We do indeed have a um, uh, important election coming up and I think uh, we'll get to some of the potential uh, policy implications of that perhaps later on. I, I, I do want to uh, sort of start with an overall comment, which is that we know that corporations have been slow to address climate, um, inequity, human rights, diversity, corruption. Uh, so have financial agents. Uh, they've been slow to do that. Uh, and yet we also know that the public uh, across many jurisdictions uh, and, and from surveys that we that, that have been put out, the public has swung in favor of addressing these issues. Um, and a Texas survey, for example, showed 75% of millennial investors, uh, that is to say people who, have, uh, who are lucky to have savings for retirement, they want their savings invested for social good. Uh, and, and, and that's something new uh, in in uh, in the uh, in the capital market.
market. Uh, BlackRock's uh, Larry Fink letter has uh, made the same point that millennial investors, younger investors, they really do want uh, investment aligned with social good. So why do we have, on the one hand, uh, corporations or private sector entities uh, uh, not keeping up uh, with what the, uh, the public wants them to do? And the answer is that we have a deficit in democracy. Uh, the capital market has been too often walled off from those who actually provide the capital. That is to say, you and me and uh, people across uh, the world who uh, might be taxpayers, they might be in state-funded schemes, for example, for pension, or they might be tens of millions uh, uh, who are lucky enough to uh, to save through uh, retirement plans. They've been; these are people that have been walled off uh, after providing the capital. They're walled off from decision making. And I think we can also conclude that during these days of the pandemic. Uh, COVID has made clear more than anything the interconnectivity of health, climate, uh, diversity, and other factors. So the challenge before us today really is how do we refashion the capital market so that citizens have a voice in the financial ecosystem? Now, studies show that if we do that, we can actually create better returns and more trusted companies and a better society. So the question that we face, as I say, is how do we move beyond business as usual and investment as usual? And I think in order for us to make that move, we have to recognize three important barriers to change. Uh, because we, if we recognize those and we can, we can fashion reform, First barrier is only a handful of bodies speak for citizens in the civil economy. There are NGOs such as Share Action uh, or a new one in the, uh, in, based in the UK called Make My Money Matter. I encourage you to look at both of those uh, uh, organizations. But those are the exceptions. In general, we don't have uh, bodies that speak for citizens. So. And, and sometimes the interests of citizens diverge from the interests of institutional investors. And I love PRI and uh, what Fiona has accomplished. I was one of the founders of PRI, but there's no doubt that there are times in, when, when interests diverge. And so it's important for or some bodies to speak on, the, on behalf of citizens. This is where parliamentarians uh, come in to so, uh, are, are so important. The second barrier is that we have a legacy of antiquated law and regulation that's shaped to suit the interests of institutional investors and corporations, but not necessarily the citizen investors. The third barrier is that we have too many institutional investors that have an inherited legacy habits of rewarding stock trading over long-term ownership and attention to things like the SDGs. In fact, uh, you know, governance features of institutional investors often lag. The hard truth is that few would be able to meet the minimum accountability and transparency requirements that they demand of portfolio companies. So this is a, a third barrier we have to recognize. And it's not true for every institution nor is it true for every corporation, but it's a general issue. So just to conclude, what we, we need recognizing those barriers is a model public policy reform agenda that's aimed at securing an accountable capitalism, which would empower citizen savers, just as we empower voters in civil society. And we need tools to do that. Uh, we need, as Fiona said, a, a new social contract. And very briefly, a few of the components would be financial literacy. This is something parliamentarians can focus on from the ground up elementary school on uh, across the world. 
Uh, we need a, 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 a reform of fiduciary duties so that institutions put clients first uh, and not their own interests first. We need, thirdly, an overhaul of the governance of institutional investors. We've spent a lot of time working on the governance of corporations and made great headway over the years, still a ways to go. But we need to now focus on the governance of institutional investors so that they too are accountable. They need to fourthly provide a kind of the equivalent of a nutrition statement so that it, citizen investors have a very clear uh, view as to how institutions are behaving in respect of SDGs and climate and human rights and other matters. And finally, I think we need a restructuring of, of some of the requirements uh, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that provide infrastructure for retirement savings. Quick example, when uh, most people who have uh, mutual funds uh, are given a choice for where to invest, they have a lot of conventional choices and then there might be one ethical or ESG social investment option. That's exactly the reverse of what ought to happen. Uh, the menu should include basically all the other options that include focus on SDGs on a green economy. And if people want, they can then select uh, a choice which doesn't address those issues. So we've got it reversed. I'll stop there for now. Thank mm, you. Well, that's um, very, uh, very helpful, Stephen. Very practical and, and crisp. Let me bring in Steph Flanders now. Um, Steph, I think you may be speaking to us from London. Um, some yeah. of you mentioned Steph is at Bloomberg, but was also the, um, the lead on a, an important inclusive growth commission here in the UK uh, a couple of years ago. Steph, let me hand over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, um, Liam. Um, I mean, we've got such a broad agenda uh, today and there's a, there's a lot of different things we can talk about. I think that um, a, a couple of things that I would, would throw in based on what we're hearing, I mean, it clearly is the case that companies are listening and actively fast-tracking this agenda. I think in a way, you know, for, I'm sure many people listening and even on the panel have um, been part of the conversation around these issues for a while and they've probably heard that kind of sentiment um, expressed, but I think we can all agree that there's been a, been a real step change uh, this year. And I'm quite struck uh, Deutsche Bank has uh, started earlier this year tracking uh, corporate mentions in reports and in the earnings calls of SDG topics. And it's striking that um, you've obviously seen a big leap this year, but even in, you know, they're actually looking at it on a quarterly basis, almost in real time. And the latest survey shows that uh, the conversation has really moved away from things that you might say were very related to the pandemic, including the, you know, the health of, of employees, and more into talking about ESG things, and particularly, interestingly, education and infrastructure and inequality. Climate change is there, and they're maybe at a slightly more practical stage when it comes to climate change, because they're actually talking about concrete projects. Um, but I thought it as striking the way that S is also featuring more and more and you can see why when you think of um, everything that's happened this year. I guess that's the good news. The bad news is that everyone knows we should have been here 10 or 15 years ago, certainly relative to the agenda, what's a very fast changing um, uh, analysis on, on the environmental risks and the pace at which those are coming down the track. And indeed, we're already seeing economic damage um, from them. I think the other bit of bad news, not to be too... Um, you know, it's been a hopeful conversation so far, and I don't want to reduce that. But I think a lot of this talk about building back better is coming at a time when governments actually still find themselves in the middle of the storm. So this idea that the dust has, has you know, is, is going to settle and then we will um, uh, set a new course for the state of the post-COVID economy that maybe accelerates some of these goals that we've had in the past. I think it's the it's a, the right place to start, but we have to be realistic about where we are now and how much we even know what what the landscape that landscape is going to look like. What are the fixed points going to be? Because we are still trying to kind of battle, not to mix enormous number of metaphors, but battle down the hatches um, right now. And I think we see that in very practical terms when Fiona talks about environmental conditionality. Clearly, that's something people have talked about very early on. And we have had examples very early on of 
the French government making uh, conditions on the money. It was the support it was offering to, to Air France and, and reducing its number of uh, domestic flights, short haul uh, flights. What strikes me about that example is it's still the main one that people are talking about four or five months down the road. There have not been another a lot of other cases where governments have been able to do quick, clean environmental conditionality. And I would argue that's because um, in the thick of the storm, when you're trying to keep businesses uh, afloat and trying to maintain jobs, which we know has such a lasting impact on a community to, to lose those jobs, it is rightly um, giving governments a lot of pause to try and think about um, putting environmental or other strings to that support. Not to say they're a bad idea, but I think we just have to be realistic about what's practical in those environments. I think when it comes to the S piece, um, potential, I think there's still more we could do uh, in relatively short order. You can ask in Manchester, actually, in the very sort of micro example, there is an employment charter which the local government, which Greater Manchester, has developed for employees to, employers to sign up to. Um, that's the kind of thing that's quite easy to say to companies, you need to be, in, in future, you need to tell us in a certain amount of time you're going to meet this charter. I think you can do those kind of practical things, but really only if you've done the work beforehand. I think try to ask governments to change the way that they're prioritising things right now um, may indeed be even be counterproductive. But the other thing I would say uh, is, you know, a lot of the debate we've seen, you know, we have a conversation here, which is partly about the entire developing the, the global agenda for SDGs, but also about how to make things, how to change the agenda for investing across the more um, developed markets. And I do think that that the, the what global piece has actually been missing from the conversation about how governments could use their role more proactively coming out of this crisis. You know, if they inherit, Liam talked about some of the some of the fiscal numbers at the start of this, if you're inheriting a big step change it by, def by definition in government's involvement in the economy, whether indirectly or directly, um, and particularly its involvement in the corporate sector, you know, you're going to have the German government, for example, is going to end up with a lot more closer ties to companies that it's been giving support to. Um, they're... Uh, We've only talked about that in the domestic terms. You know, how could they use their influence over those companies domestically? I would say in a world of globalization, there should be much more explicit linking and thinking about um, those companies' behavior uh, globally, because we know that that's you know, often a big piece of their, their activity and could even be a way of them, they could meet the domestic uh, new goals and then be sort of exporting all the bad stuff abroad. This is a very familiar issue, but I would say it's not been heard so much in that conversation, in that sort of post-COVID um, conversation. And I do think um, there is room for doing that because the, the, the rumours of the death of the global supply chains, I think, is, have been greatly, uh, greatly exaggerated. The only other thing I'd say is, you know, just to echo uh, what Fiona's trying to do, and I think there's probably more to be done there in setting standards, giving clarity and sort of legal certainty to investors. One other thing I would say, which is, is always the issue, is data. And I think although we think we've done a lot better job of gathering data that investors can base their decisions on, I'm not sure in practice we have um, as we've heard just earlier, the kind of clarity that we need. But I'll leave it there. I think you're muted, Mian. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Um, finally, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Julio, to round off this introductory section. Hello. Hello, oh, Liam. Hello. Hi there. Yeah. Good to see you. Hello. Hi there. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and thank you for uh, for inviting me. I'm I'm Italian, but uh, I'm an Italian MP, but here I represent the um, Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean, which includes all the uh, countries on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, so uh, each coast, uh, north, south, and uh, and east, of course. So um, I'd like to uh, to stress that. Uh, 
the pandemic uh, pushed us to rethink of our business model. And this is an occasion that comes uh, um, once in a lifetime. And we may focus in particular on the resilience and sustainability of our businesses. And um, together with them, we have to think also uh, how to build uh, green models and inclusive models, because all the mistakes, all the problems we had in the past, and we're still having, look at what's happening in the Mediterranean, for example, concerning the war on energy, the Mediterranean and the as well, um, were caused by uh, inequality and instability, basically. So we have to focus on these factors. And uh, in particular, in the Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean area and uh, in the Gulf area, we feel uh, the urgency of an intervention on sustainability and uh, um, and uh, green businesses because of the scarcity of resources that we feel it's tangible in many of our countries, including the European ones. Uh, observing the uh, business ecosystem in our areas, we can see that SMEs are the heart of the domestic economies in the Mediterranean. So 99% of businesses and 90% of employment opportunities are in SME. So like uh, uh, as seen in some European countries like France, Spain, but also in Egypt, Morocco, and the UAE, reinforcing the role of the private sector and SME on the path of recovery and green growth requires strong public-private partnership. And earlier, uh, Ms. Reynolds was focusing on uh, PPP, a different kind of PPPs, but uh, again, public-private partnerships, especially where the private sector cannot reach, where the private sector need a uh, help. And then we will get back, also getting back on the words of the previous speaker. Um, so that as uh, lawmakers, we should think of legislative reforms in order to do that. Furthermore, uh, prioritizing the SMEs means also giving them access to capital markets. This is what we discussed uh, two years ago in, uh, in a three days, uh, three days uh, study days in Milan and the Italian Stock Exchange, um, involving uh, 132 parliamentarians and talking on how to develop the access to capital markets and entrepreneurship in our area. Um, and in order to support these efforts, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean is uh, engaging the implementation of a startup market project. And the initiative, uh, which is a platform, uh, wants to establish a digital platform to enable entrepreneurs, startups, and investors from the region to meet. It is also needed to reduce uh, asymmetries in the information, and we have to strengthen business relationship. This platform represents an innovative tool to foster technological innovation and sustainable entrepreneurship in the Euro Mediterranean and the Gulf countries. Going back to the words I heard, uh, especially from uh, the first uh, speaker, if I'm not mistaken, um, the question from the IFC, the question was how do we involve the private sector and the private savings in the real economy? Well, uh, in Italy, we have been thinking about it and we've been discussing also in the parliamentary assembly in the Mediterranean. Uh, why am I talking to Italy? Not just because, of, because I'm Italian, but private savings are uh, really high. We have 3,000 billions of private savings, and we try to build with legal framework financial instruments, usually using tax deduction, uh, to push the people to invest. But uh, yeah, they were successful, but not as much. And uh, here I go back to the words of Professor Davis, because uh, what we need is financial literacy. In my country, we uh, set forth a law 
to introduce uh, financial education starting from uh, not primary schools but junior schools and, and so on. But it's very important because it's a matter of culture, and this was highlighted also yesterday in the committee and uh, the Chamber of Deputy in the Financial Committee, where the Italian Association of Private Banking said people are not investing much as uh, in other European countries in product of private banking because there's no culture. So, again, Professor Davis is correct, we need to introduce uh, a natural literacy. Ms. von Friedeburg uh, asked how to involve uh, private businesses in, uh, uh, in uh, developing countries. Well, uh, from our experience, um, a legal framework is not enough. Um, there is a need of uh, tenders backed by maybe the state or backed by insurance products issued by a uh, multilateral institution. And uh, it is important, uh, as we notice on the EU targets uh, uh, of reduction of 20% uh, CO2 emissions by 2020, it is important to include local authorities, not only um, state and governments, but also cities, provinces, and uh, regions uh, according to the uh, uh, institutional geography of uh, every country. So, I would like uh, uh, to conclude and uh, to say just that we need to start calculating the true cost and uh, understanding the true colors of our business as usual in order to fully recognize the benefits of a green transition. A green transition is very important also for the geopolitical balance and in order not to accept anymore that some countries are violating human rights uh, or any other uh, international convention, by especially human rights. And we see what's happening in the world today, what we see what's happening in the Mediterranean where there is a real war, uh, and only our combined efforts to achieve more inclusive and uh, green economic system, circular economic systems, can guarantee a resilient society, competitive businesses, employee stability, and geopolitical stability again in the long run. Thank you for the attention, and I would like to thank uh, the World Bank, the, the IMF, the Parliamentary Network, and I would like to Thank you, William, to, to always organize uh, this important and interesting meetings. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that we were able to um, bring in your perspective there because I just think that the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean is one of the places where um, this debate is, um, uh, is, is, is really lively. And I think we can learn a lot from listening to some of the debates that you're having. Right, I'm going to open up to my colleagues now. We're going to crack through seven sets of questions. Um, if you can be as quick as you can, we will maximise the time um, for our speakers to, to answer. Um, so if I can go to Daya, um, please, in Indonesia first, that would be fantastic. And then I'm going to come to Esther in Spain. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Liam. Firstly, thank you again for today's very, very insightful session. Uh, my name is Diarodo Esti and I'm a parliamentarian from Indonesia, currently in Commission 7 of the Indonesian Parliament, um, which deals with the energy uh, research and also technology sectors. And I wanted to kind of just quickly remind all of us um, that on top of the climate crisis, especially now um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're faced with, you know, a rise in both an economic um, uh, social health uh, crisis as well. And in a way, it kind of gives us an idea of what's to come if we continue uh, doing business as usual without taking precautions and, and really just addressing climate change altogether. And with that being said, I wanted to give a quick update on what we are doing right now in Indonesia, given the urgency of, of climate change and, and complying with our uh, NDCs or NDC target of really just decreasing greenhouse gas emissions by 29% in 2030, and also uh, in fulfilling a 23% renewables target by um, 2025. We're right now working on passing a renewable energy bill. Um, and and we, we believe that, you know, climate change is an issue that needs to be addressed 
past pre-COVID-19, uh, during COVID-19, but also post-COVID-19, right? And, and we understand that, you know, investors need policy reform. And so this bill seeks to make renewable energy more competitive within the energy market, including um, enacting a carbon pricing as well as a feed and tariff scheme, uh, scheme as well. And, and we hope this will give way to uh, private investment and, and with the hopes of really just pushing green growth uh, as a whole and, and creating an overall multiplier effect, whether it be job creation and, and really just everything that comes along with it. And, and I understand that end of the day, you know, global cooperation is very, very necessary. And there are limits to how much uh, the government can, can do. And so my question really is just, you know, in your opinion, and it extends to every everybody in the panel, um, how can uh, developed countries really just participate in, in climate funding, uh, particularly to countries that are, for example, less well off um, and, and are more prone to the negative impacts to climate change um, as a whole? So I just wanted to hear some thoughts on that. Thank you, Liam. Brilliant. Thank you, Don. Um, Esther, over in Spain, and then I'm going to come to Jayanne in India. Esther. Good afternoon. Hey. Good afternoon. Thanks uh, to the organization for this event and to give us floor to give our opinions. And I think it's important uh, this kind of meeting to better understand the coronavirus pandemic and also the political solutions, the private sector solutions and the role of the parliament that can promote different policies to, to better uh, give up uh, from this situation. Let me introduce myself. My name is Esther Del Brio. I'm the economics speaker of the Conservative Party in the Spanish Senate, but I'm also a professor of finance in the Eldest University of Spain, Salamanca. So I've been doing research for many years on the role of gender gaps and financial education as ways to uh, promote inclusive growth. So this afternoon, uh, we talk about a new social contract that we may pose to private sector. And my question, very shortly, will be in which way we can include financial uh, and gender inclusion in this social contract uh, to promote and contribute uh, to, uh, to, to get inclusive growth, I mean. And I want to mainly to focus on one point. Um, quite commonly, the access of women to labor force has been determined by the consideration as low cost labor force. So they are usually attached to the lowest positions and receive the lowest salary. I understand, and that is my question, that education may represent the way of reducing this gender gap but may also increase the pay gender gap if women don't receive a salary as high, as high as men do. So I would like to know your opinions about in which way education and private companies may help to reduce the glass ceiling and the sticky floor. Yeah. And complementarily, how we can also enhance the use of financial instruments, mainly in low GDP countries, to promote this inclusive role. Yeah. Thanks a lot and yes. congratulations. Brilliant, brilliant question. Um, right, uh, Jayan, you're in India, and then I'm going to come to Sammy, who's in the Congo. And Sammy, I'm going to just ask you to turn your camera on, um, if that's okay. But Jayan first in India. Thank you. Hi there. Good to see you. Hi, Liam, and uh, very good evening uh, to all of you. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to join this uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, and of course, uh, I think uh, all the panelists and uh, all those asking questions are raising all the right issues uh, for uh, a strong and sustainable recovery uh, from the COVID pandemic. One of the issues uh, that we're dealing with, and I chair the Standing Committee on Finance uh, in the Indian Parliament, uh, and uh, we have been struggling with this set of issues, and uh, I perhaps think uh, that uh, uh, other developing countries uh, may be facing similar problems. Uh, is ensuring that we have payment security uh, and stability uh, in uh, revenues for our private sector investors, yeah. uh, particularly when they invest in infrastructure. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, if you're investing in renewable energy as a private sector investor or in water facilities, uh, electric mobility of various kinds and so on, uh, you're dependent on a variety of government institutions at all levels, whether it is uh, the national level, state level, local level, uh, government sector organizations uh, that uh, are providing you revenues uh, and uh, you know you're collecting obviously from them. 
Now, very often, particularly right now, given that fiscal space is limited and uh, uh, governments are going through severe difficulties in, in making uh, their own payments, uh, uh, our private sector investors and private sector companies uh, don't get paid on time. Uh, in India alone, this problem uh, is estimated at being somewhere in the region of uh, 60 to $80 billion right now in terms of outstanding payments uh, from government entities uh, to private sector players. Sometimes it's just delayed payments. Instead of paying in 30 days, people pay 90 days or six months later or a year later. Sometimes it's people raising frivolous objections to just avoid making payments and so on. Now, as a bureaucrat or as a politician, and of course, I sit on that side as well, uh, this is the smart thing to do. Uh, but for investors uh, and uh, for business people, this uh, is... Uh, uh, something that destroys their economics. Uh, and of course, it raises risks down uh, the, the road. And what's very difficult is in the bureaucratic system to convince bureaucrats and politicians that risk and delays cost a lot of money. And obviously, if risks go up, my hurdle rates go up as an investor. Instead of investing at 15 or 18% IRR, I want to invest in 20 or 25% IRR if I have to deal with these kinds of risks. And that, of course, creates uh, a cutoff for a lot of projects and a lot of very valuable projects which can't make 20, 25% IRR thresholds and virtually no infrastructure project can. Uh, you know, those projects just simply don't happen. So this is a very pervasive problem of uncertainty in payments, delayed payments, uh, frivolous objections, uh, all kinds of lawsuits, et cetera, which I think are really leading to uh, far lower investment than is socially desirable. And I think it's very important for multilateral agencies to work uh, on their end to see what they can do about this, and also to intervene with national governments to, to be able to establish uh, agencies that can guarantee these kinds of payments. Uh, for example, in India, one of the reasons why our uh, renewable uh, energy uh, has, has grown as quickly as it has is because we've created the Solar Energy Corporation of India uh, that has guaranteed payments uh, to uh, uh, solar uh, power generators. So are there interventions like this? Are there mechanisms like this that we can innovate in so that we can make payments far more secure and enable far more projects to happen? Uh, that would Thank be a question you. I would pose. Really great, great, great question. Right. Sunny in Congo, are you there? If not, I'm going to come to my colleague Shamsul in... Um, well, you were in London the last I saw you, Shamsul, but <laughs> maybe back in Malaysia now. Let me yeah, come to I'm you. I'm going to try and track down Sammy, but Shamshul, let me give you the floor now. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, I'm Gordon <laughs> Center. <laughs> honorable Chair and uh, members of the distinguished panels and, and honorable colleagues, I have a very uh, short uh, question and rather intervention here. Well, uh, as, as we are all aware that the uh, uh, lockdowns from COVID-19 has had a severe impact uh, on businesses. Hence, uh, forcing the board members and the shareholders to reflect uh, on their core values. Uh, certain realizations might have come to surface as a result of the struggles faced by uh, their own communities and also countries. And this, this could be an opportunity for the government to encourage or incentivize uh, shareholders to shift their priorities uh, towards goals more aligned to sustainability and equitability. So, uh, any ideas on what practical measures or incentives can governments introduce uh, to achieve this? And another question, to, uh, Liam, uh, just a very short one. Uh, digitalization has been associated with efficiency and business sustainability. Should the focus of technology be towards building a digitally, uh, digitally, digitally skilled talent pool, which could change the mindset of the workforce? Or should the focus be on digitally powering the actual businesses and industries uh, is set. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, right, I'm going to go to Red Har now in Bahrain, and then Issa, who's in Chad, and I'm going to rely on a fantastic technical crew backstage to tell me if they can get hold of Sammy for me. But otherwise, Red Har in Bahrain, floor is yours, sir. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for sort of giving me the opportunity to ask the question. I'm Radha Farid from the Shura Council of Bahrain. I think this, I'm the deputy sort of uh, president for this committee of finance and economic affairs. And we do work closely with the private sector and the government in order to bring out the legislations which helps or 
enables the private sector to do their business effectively and efficiently. I have again this sort of a question, which is really restarting the economy will need to be a core objective of development finance, whatever we think of. How do you see ODFIs rethinking their approach to finance with regard to the governments, small businesses, and technology? Where will the emphasis be directed? Smaller institutions or larger government entities? Also, in a post-2020 world where global trade and supply chain management were strained and reverse globalization became a common theme. How do you see us overcoming these hurdles? Thank you very much. And excellent. I think it has been an Wonderful. excellent thank opportunity you. for exchange. Yeah, of views. thank you. And then let me just come to Issa now, uh, who is in chat. Hi there, Issa. I can see you, but you're on mute. There we go. Thank you. We, uh, Greetings. I think you can hear me. Yes. Wonderful. I would like to uh, give my greetings to the members of the panels. I'm Issa Mardo, uh, deputy to the National Assembly of Chad, and I'm chairing the commission on the follow-up of the implementation of the uh, sustainable development goals. Allow me to first uh, pay tribute to the members of the panels for their presentations. They're very interesting uh, presentations and simply say that Chad is gradually coming out of the uh, immediate health crisis tied to COVID-19. However, the main concern today remains the creation of a climate that is positive for uh, investment. This is the only way to create uh, sustainable jobs, jobs and to start the recovery with an intensification of the private sector's intervention. Through the implementation of these favorable conditions for investment, we need to promote the sector in which the Chad has a comparative advantage. This is very important. So allow me to follow to, to ask this question. What are the lessons, short and long terms, that we can draw from this pandemic crisis when we know that Chad has a relatively high debt with a large deficit of public expenditures and a strong a strong mobilization of private investment uh, uh, followed by a restructuring to restart the economy this would allow us to reach the SDGs that Chad has adopted. That is what we need. What is the mechanism that we can put in place? What are the windows? This would be most helpful to us to be able to have a an, an good economy post COVID-19. COVID Thank you. Wonderful. Well, there we go. So a quick tour of the planet. A uh, wide range of issues, um, and we're going to give you 15 minutes to answer them all. <laughs> so, um, so we've got um, Stephanie, Luke, uh, Stephen, and uh, Julio still on the on the line. Um, so there's about five minutes actually for you each to just pick um, what you'd like to respond to there. Um, and just a quick reminder to everybody who's on the call that um, we can go into a lot more depth in some of the answers on our digital platform that we're launching um, this week as well, website in the chat. But Stephanie, let me hand the floor to you first for your reflections. Thanks, Liam. What an interesting set of questions. We could spend many hours on these. Um, yeah, we maybe could. I'll kind of try to bucket them. Uh, first one, when we think about energy and, and tech sectors. So I talked a little bit about our scaling solar program. I think it's the, the mindset that we need to come into. And it, I think it links back to what um, our Indian colleague was talking about as well in terms of finding ways to backstop government support for large power projects and especially green power projects. 
Um, we have the private sector window, which we use for the IDA balance sheet to do just this. And we need to push the DFIs to think about creating more instruments um, that link public IFI balance sheets and private IFI balance sheets so that you can have um, partial guarantees and then you bring the private sector in to actually develop the project. Um, the second thing I wanted to comment on was this notion of arrears. I think it's very important and what we collectively need to do is push the IMF um, to ensure that we're actually looking at arrears in public companies as we disperse money. Because if we can clean those up, if it's one, two, three percent of GDP, we can move that money into the private sector companies and back into the economy and not leave additional debt uh, on the burden of the, of the government. So I think arrears is an important thing. And then maybe lastly, just touching on this idea about technology and digitalization. Somebody asked, do we, do we create skills or do we create tech companies? And I think the answer to that is a both and. We need to have our citizens be educated enough to be able to use technology and to be able to access technology companies. Then we need a group of skilled uh, tech people who can actually found and grow the technology companies that will become revenue generators in the future. And we can't lose sight of either one of them. My concern is when you think about the number of children in our countries that are out of school and potentially not going back to school and quite frankly, not connected to the internet. It's not clear to me how we actually close that divide. And I think it's something as we build back better, we really need to focus on. Super, super helpful. Did you have a particular perspective on the point about big companies, small companies? Um, yeah, I think that's a very up, interesting come up a lot for us, I think. Yeah, and I, I think there was some conversation earlier about how, how much does the government actually take over. I think yeah. we would like to see if the government does step in a path to get them back out. We don't want to end up with larger SOEs. Uh, we also don't want to create, um, you know, isolated private sector companies that operate as monopolies either. But SMEs employ somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of the people in the world. We cannot ignore SMEs. What we need to do, and I think this links back to what Stephen had said, we need to create better financial literacy and we need to make financing available to those SMEs, not just debt, but equity, and to help them understand better how they run their companies and bring them into the formal sector. Perfect. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much. And um, Luke, now I'm, I'm sorry again that I cut you off slightly earlier, but I mean, you've got a wealth of experience there. Um, any reflections on some of the questions that you've heard from um, our parliamentarians? Uh, allow me to just react on the last point of uh, what was said uh, from India and from Chad. I think what matters is create conditions, a climate favorable to the private investors. That's what we try to do in Cote d'Ivoire with the support of the various donors, in particular the World Bank Group. The certainty of cash flows for private sector company is essential. So how to guarantee the cash flow? We need to modelize these cash flows on the longer term, meet with representatives of development institutions to secure guarantees for those and reassure the private investors for the longer term. So it is this approach that has been followed and formalized through an institutional framework in Cote d'Ivoire and which today is working remarkably well. Very useful, very useful. I think we may um, try and extract some um, written material from you on this because I think there's some experience there that we'd all benefit from. Now, now, Stephen, you've obviously um, heard quite a range of topics there. I'm not sure which, which would you like to zero in yeah, on. Yeah, I uh, um, thanks, Liam. There are three that I'd I'd uh, comment on. Uh, one is uh, first Esther's uh, 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 question about uh, gender equality. And I think this is where the private sector has proven itself very powerful. Uh, you need only look at how one of the largest investors in the world, State Street Global Advisors, uh, did some, it was really just a PR exercise in a way. They created this statue, a commission to statue called the Fearless Girl, and they put it on Wall Street. And it has, it became a viral exercise around the world the fearless girl became a, a symbol uh, for gender equity. 
Uh, and uh, so just be, I mean, it went beyond State Street, in other words. And we have seen since that, that uh, institutional investors right across the world have taken on that issue of gender equity, have raised it with companies. And we've seen a, uh, that compare in, in, in a, a, a alongside of public policy efforts on gender uh, equality have made a big difference. Uh, we've got a long way to go, but you can see where the private sector can actually be a powerful player in that in that area. So I would I would really try to focus on uh, moving our uh, investing institutions to taking that on. Uh, second question uh, that I wanted to address was Siri's question from Malaysia. What can a government do to incent um, more attention to SDGs and to environmental, social, and governance issues? And I think as I, I do want to underscore the financial literacy. Uh, this is something that governments and parliamentarians can, uh, can uh, install across the world. And I would say that it's not just uh, financial literacy in the way it's traditionally taught, which is very focused on uh, conventional understandings. Uh, and, but un unfortunately for my field, uh, some of the biggest issues that we think about today, such as climate and human rights are considered, in fact, they're called externalities, as if they have no role in value creation, uh, uh, let alone uh, social equity. So I think financial literacy needs to address conventional understandings, but also the importance of human rights, gender equity, climate, and how all those factors contribute to overall uh, value. So financial literacy is one. Malaysia has actually done itself a very interesting approach to uh, try to get institutions to get uh, more involved in these issues with the what is called uh, the watchdog group. That may not be the perfect model, but it was an interesting model. And it may be that we can adapt that where governments can try to uh, move uh, sovereign wealth funds and public pension funds and other retirement systems so that they have to address uh, uh, SDGs. And then finally, just to Issa's uh, point about um, uh, what uh, governments can do to incent investments, we have very good examples of, uh, uh, for example, Haukama, which I'm involved with in the UAE. Uh, we have the um, Al Faisal University in in uh, in, in the Saudi Arabia. We have Egypt uh, doing work on corporate governance. In each of these countries, there's an effort to try to move companies toward the highest end of disclosure and, and responsibility on issues around governance, environmental, and social. If we can do that, if governments can really move companies within their jurisdictions to demonstrate that they have governance risk under control, social risk under control, uh, then that's going to inevitably uh, attract investment from around the world. Very helpful. I mean, Stephanie, I don't know whether you are able to reflect on, in your experience at the moment, I mean, do you think institutional investors are is, is there a critical mass of institutional investors now, the kinds of investors that you want to see co-invest with you that are now up for this discussion? Uh, and I guess, how do we as parliamentarians accelerate the development of some of the new frameworks we might need? So, uh, Lee, might, uh, about two years ago, we actually launched something called the Impact Principles with the idea that we would bring investors along with us. We now have 104 signatories to the Impact Principles, and they're some of the biggest investors in the world. And so we are beginning to see uh, investors asking the right questions. I think what we need to do uh, is shift the conversation, not just to asset managers, but to asset owners. I think somebody said earlier, they were talking about the millennials and the desires for the millennials to put their money in different places. That is the, the, the mental shift that must take place because when asset owners ask asset allocators, this is what I'm looking for, then we'll actually see, in my opinion, a much larger push toward um, impact investing and people who are looking at uh, some of these issues on a more holistic basis. Yeah, interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, Julio, let me give you the final word, if that's okay with you. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Liam. Uh, well, 
First of all, I saw a question. It's uh, how to use the EU taxonomy to improve uh, sustainable businesses. I think a nice example was uh, uh, the covenant of mayors. It means uh, there was a kind of covenant uh, among cities of different uh, EU member states where um, they were focusing on the target of producing the CO2 emissions, like by changing a uh, uh, source of energy or uh, planting uh, specific trees like uh, liquid amber, which consume more CO2 by um, changing the public transportation system. So a lot can be done at really local level and uh, the multiplier is higher than uh, doing tenders at the central level. Then um, uh, something that is key, and it was shown also by the mega trend in this moment. And if you are in the UK, you have seen that the London Stock Exchange sold the uh, Milano Stock Exchange in order to buy Refinitiv. So data is the is the new oil. Mm. Data is the new oil, and uh, as a parliamentarian, we need to focus on data. If there are clear data, then asset owners asset managers and other kind of investors, even uh, business angels or private investors would invest because they know where they're investing in. What we need to do is to decrease the price of data and to facilitate in some extent um, the access to capital markets, uh, equity and debt or hybrid, uh, hybrid system. Moreover, uh, we should uh, agree with uh, our um, state-owned companies issuing insurances in case you, a company, a British company, Italian company, a Moroccan company goes to other countries uh, to issue specific insurance instrument to go to specific country to reach specific targets. Like, I don't know, we need to focus on uh, Malaysia because uh, there are some issues on the uh, palm oil and we need to reconvert the production in uh, a more sustainable uh, agriculture, well, there should be some uh, uh, insurance coverage or some tax advantages. So this is my, these are my, my considerations and uh, yeah. I think that something we can all do, like decreasing the price of data, really. I think it's important and make yeah. it accessible also to small, small, small investors. Thanks to, thanks to FinTech, for example. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, let me bring things to a conclusion there. I very much um, hope that everyone has enjoyed uh, and found this conversation really useful. I certainly have. I think it's an important part of the um, discussion that we as parliamentarians have got to try and uh, steward over the course of the next year. Um, there are four aspects of this that I think we can really begin to um, develop. One is around motive. So we're beginning a debate here about the purpose of finance in London. Um, we're finding this very useful because there are obviously generational shifts in uh, the financial services industry and younger generations, frankly, coming up um, who want to know why they go to work. Um, and just zeroing in on that, um, the purpose of finance, we think is a, a good place to start. And on the demand side, there's lots of us around the world that have now got um, interesting projects underway around community wealth building and the way in which we use the power of public procurement. Um, like the charter in Manchester that Stephanie mentioned to try and drive up rights. Um, what Stephanie has talked about with um, getting to asset owners, I think is absolutely critical. Um, and um, just to pick up that point on data, I think we will all find very, very quickly that the financial reporting systems that we've got at the moment just do not give us the kind of information that we need in order to make good, ethical, green, inclusive investment decisions. Um, and so we are going to have to bring that um, family of regulators into the conversation as well. So this is the um, the fourth and final session that we've had this week for the Parliamentary Network. Um, so I'd like you to join me in just saying an enormous thank you to uh, to Gagana and Philippe at the Parliamentary Network, to Nai, Celia, Jennifer Beckman and Sheila Redzepi, um, Shelto and Maloud, our technical team and all of their colleagues with them, um, and of course, to our fantastic crew of interpreters. Thank you so much indeed for making it possible for us to come together this week at this critical moment in our work together. With that, I'll bid you good afternoon. Thanks very much for joining us and keep following the debate at parlnet.org. Thanks very much. <laughs>